too. So just so you know. All right. So um, we're live today. Um, and so I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Nikki Navta, the CEO of Zulama. We are a company based in Pittsburgh. We've developed a um, curriculum and, and platform and teacher training that schools are using, middle schools and high schools, to teach game design in their own classrooms and that includes video game design and board game design and disciplines like digital art, programming, game design, um, storytelling. It's a very well-rounded program. So I'm thrilled to be hosting today. This is uh, our monthly hang out on air and it's part of an affinity group here in Pittsburgh and the group's name is called Remaking Learning Using Games, Interactive Technology and Hands-On Projects. So we got started as an offshoot to other affinity groups that uh, are loosely bound to uh, are part of the culture at uh, the Sprout Fund here in Pittsburgh which is a part of the Remake Learning Network and it's really a loose group of very forward-thinking educators, business people and community members, anybody who's really uh, interested in forwarding innovation and, and um, change in education. So this is actually the 32nd hangout in our affinity group series. So um, if anybody is listening live, there are, you can put comments or questions in the YouTube YouTube window and then also we do watch Twitter when we are talking today and uh, the Twitter hashtags that we use are um, hashtag RML Hangout for Remake Learning, that's what RML stands for, Hangout, and um, hashtag Game Design, we'll be, we'll be watching those hashtags. So without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our uh, our guests today, we have two guests, um, Albert and Michael. Um, Albert is has his own um, indie game development company and we can let him explain what indie game means and how he came to be the owner of his own company. And then also Michael uh, is working for Shell Games and I'd like to let them both introduce themselves. So let's let um, Albert go first. Hey everyone, I'm Albert. Um, so basically I graduated from um, the program called Entertainment Technology, which is a master's program at CMU, and afterwards I started doing my own indie game company. And you know, what an indie game, in the sense, basically just not a very large-scaled, you know, super well-funded uh, game studio. It's mo mostly just like you doing your own thing and uh, putting out your own games out there. And the reason that I ended up doing this is because during school, I was working on this project, um, this game that was called Museum of Simulation Technology, and it was doing okay, but I, I didn't have time to really finish the game, so I wanted to continue that uh, after I graduated. So I kind of started my own indie game studio, but really now it's just like two people. <laughs> um, but yourself, hopefully and yourself and who else? And uh, Logan, who is doing some game design for the game, um, uh, some level design to be specific, and and this is just the guy I met up later. But but anyways, ho hopefully we'll be you know getting a few more people on board and trying to finish the game um, sometime soon. Yeah. So um, the Entertainment Technology Center program that you mentioned is a master's level program, right? It's two years. Um, where did you do your undergraduate education? I actually did, had my undergrad at the same place at CMU, and I had a computer uh, science. Okay. And how did you find the Entertainment Technology Center and decide to go there? Why did you decide to go there for graduate school? Mm -hmm. uh, I felt that you know, because when you go, when you finish school, your goal is to have a portfolio and be able to, you know, go to companies and say, you know, I want to work here. Do you want me? And I, I felt that, you know, my stuff wasn't that strong enough and didn't have that much experience making games. So I wanted like just a few extra years of experience. And what about before undergrad? Where did you go to high school? Uh, I went to high school actually in Taiwan. Okay. And, uh, and this, 
place called uh, National Experimental High School. Um, but anyways, they they do both uh, English and Chinese training, so it's like bi it's a bilingual school. Mm -hmm. So, what got you interested in going to Carnegie Mellon then, from Taiwan in high school? Um, hmm, that's a good question. I guess <laughs> I haven't really thought about it, but it was mainly because I knew uh, CMU was very science-based mm -hmm. um, school, and I wanted to do something sciency in that sense. All right, so you knew you were interested. So are you interested in doing games that have anything to do with science, or do you just use your science interest uh, as part of the game development process? Um, okay, so I, I, I guess I started out um, going to college. I was a physics major at first, um, okay. but, but very, very quickly I transferred to computer science. And the reason was that in uh, my first class, during college was a class called Programming with Graphics, right? So it's this very easy intro class um, that from the, on the very first class they teach you how to draw a rectangle. And and so I've, t I've taken program classes before. And they're always about doing very text-based things, right? It's like, you know, how do you parse a string? You know, how do you emulate a uh, vending machine, right? If you give if you give it thirty cents, we don't what do, what do you get back? <laughs> now, and so like those things weren't interesting to me at all. But once I started drawing things on the screen and doing interactive stuff, I really quickly became interested in kind of what I could do. Mm. Right. That's cool. Yeah. yeah, I can see where that would really draw you in to have have an experience that's more interactive and actually create sa something that you're more interested in creating rather than sort of a you know a sort of make do make work kind of a of a project, right? That's yeah. true. Yeah, and it's and it's weird because I've taken maybe two or three programming classes before then, but I just never it just never really clicked for me, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I never wanted to do my own thing or like work on it in my spare time because it was just not interesting. Cool. Yeah. All right, so then that's good background. I have lots of questions already, but let's uh, let Michael introduce himself and then we can come back to some of my questions. Cool. Hey everyone, so I'm Michael Lee. So I'm a game engineer at Shell Games, uh, currently technical director on a project there called Happy Atoms, which is a chemistry education game. And also in my spare time, I do a bunch of different things. I'm on the board of the Pittsburgh International Game Developers Association, or PICDA for short. So we organize game development meetups here in Pittsburgh. And I also have my own uh, independent studio where I've been working with another guy making small mobile titles and releasing them over the past few years. Mm. So that's where I, that's, that's the work I'm doing right now. Uh, Education-wise, I also came from the Entertainment Technology Center um, and the, from their master's program. I was a year, yeah, a year and a half before Albert was there, actually. And before that, I actually worked for a little bit as a freelance web developer. Mm -hmm. So that was about four years that I that I was doing uh, websites and back-end server stuff for a bunch of different companies. And then as an undergrad, I did, a, I did sort of a dual major thing. I had a computer science uh, degree, and I also did sort of a multidisciplinary thing, where it was sort of like a build-your-own course, and there's a lot of like, English and cultural studies involved in there. And, and for uh, undergrad, I w I'm from North Carolina, so I went to North Carolina State. Go Wolfpack. So. <laughs> That's great. Um, so one thing I'm curious about is when in each of your lives did you each decide you were interested in becoming part of the game design industry, like actually working in game design? And even, I mean, is it because you were gamers as kids, or where did that come from? Where did that interest come from? Uh, you, want, you want to take this first, Mike? Yeah, I can, I can go first <laughs> here. Yeah. It is sort of funny, because I think from a very young age, 
I've always enjoyed playing games. Like, my parents bought me a Nintendo en- entertainment system back in the <laughs> or something. Yeah. So I, I was playing games really young, but I didn't really think of game development as a career until near the end of middle school, where it wasn't actually a game that made me want to play, but a application called a hypercard on the old uh, Mac. I completely remember hypercard. You could actually you could actually kind of make little rudimentary games oh, with totally. Apple Card, right? And yeah. it was like cuz hypercard was sort of this um, multimedia application. Yeah. And it was like it was based around the paradigm of having a deck and different cards and you can link cards to different decks. Mm-hmm. And yeah, you could totally make like just saying that out loud, you can think like, oh yeah, you can make like a choose your own adventure game or something like that. And what you, I remember, I got the app was so easy to use. Yeah. I got deep into it, and eventually I made like a choose your own adventure, sort of an adventure game, using my middle school as the background and different like students and teachers as like um, characters to interact with, and it ended up with like a. There's this one teacher who we, this is sort of embarrassing to talk about, we called her, <laughs> but she transforms into a slime monster and then eats you at the end. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. We, we didn't, we actually liked her, but she was like the chemistry teacher, so she all had all these weird, like, uh, weird little habits that we sort of translate into her becoming this monster at the end. But, <laughs> and that's when it's like, oh, I, I really enjoy making making entertainment for people, and particularly I enjoy making get something that's interactive, and that's what uh, inspired me to start thinking about games as a career and moving forward from there. Interesting. How about you, Andrew? Or Albert, I'm sorry. <laughs> no <problem>. Andrew. <laughs> Um, so I was I was a relatively late starter. Um, you know, yeah, I started in college. I mean, my first game, um, in the first maybe like just like three weeks or four weeks into college in my in my uh, programming course. Um, and then from there on, it was for me it was most like I've always played games, but I've just never really put together what it was like to actually make a game or how you did that, right? And once I was able to do that, I could put, put together really quickly, like, oh, okay, I can do computer science. You can also, that can easily translate to making games. And that's not as hard as I thought it would be. And then later on, it, be, it, it became like, oh, it actually is pretty hard. You know, but at that time, it was just like that, that moment when I realized it was, it was possible. Um, <laughs> So once you realize that, then what what did each of you? Um, what kinds of things did you investigate? Like, for instance, you know, how did you find the Entertainment Technology Center? And before you decided to go there, had you applied to other programs that were similar to it, and, or did you look at other other options in terms of school for for game design? Um, I'll I'll go first. Because my answer is actually pretty simple, is because so there's this undergrad plus uh, grad school program which takes only uh, five years, mm-hmm. and it was also very close. So to me, it was more of a convenience thing, mm-hmm. but also because you know I've seen the videos with Randy Pausch, um, talking about you know his the program that he started, and there's you can if you if you see his video, it's like wow, that's actually a very creative, inspiring thing, right? Yeah. And I want to be a, a part of that. Um, yeah, so, Randy. Yeah. Pa- Randy was very inspirational, wasn't he? It's called. I mean, anybody can look it up on YouTube. The last lecture was really his, mm-hmm. his. I think most inspiring video. Kind of a right. tragic and sad story, but still very inspiring nonetheless. And it's pretty funny because he talks about the ETC in that video, but mm-hmm. I think that like most people on the CMU campus doesn't know it's related, right? Or yeah, like, yeah. Know. How about you, Michael? How did you decide to go to the ETC? Oh, wait. so I sort of had a, as from my bio, a little bit of a winding path. <laughs> because um, what, after I graduated, um, you know, for a while I did some web development stuff. Right. And, you know, websites is interesting and there's some good 
good clients, also some bad clients. But it wasn't at the end of the day like out. You know, websites are things for people just to use, and it was like people weren't really getting a lot of enjoyment out of it, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like I want to make something that brings people fun and happiness and you know pleasure to their lives. So that's cool. But so, so it certainly wasn't convenient for you to move from North Carolina to Pittsburgh, right? Um, so so you, I, you must have researched some other programs, right? Oh yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, for sure. And so. There, you know, because the ETC, there's, well, back then, there weren't too many other programs. Now there's a lot of different game design programs at a lot of different schools, but sort of around the time when I started investigating, you know, you had, um, you had like, you, uh, Southern Cal has their uh, interactive media program. Um, there's also Georgia Tech with their digital media program. There's uh, DigiPen up in Washington State. Mm-hmm. And uh, also uh, DePaul in Chicago. So those were the sort, of the sort of the places I looked at under the ETC. But what really attracted me to the to the ETC was I had some knowledge of some of the previous projects they worked on. And in particular, there's one project called the Experimental Gameplay Project. Mm -hmm. And that's you know that's uh, a very famous sort of group of students getting together and deciding we're going to make a game every week for the entire semester. And from that, they made a bunch of really cool prototypes. And one of those prototypes, uh, Tower Agoo, went on to become a really amazing game called World Agoo. And sort of those guys showcased, like, hey, you can come here, create something, and then take that forward from the school and make it into something larger, sort of what Albert's doing right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that, that's what, seeing that come out of the ETC was one of the things that really attracted me to the program. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I did some research, learned about the professors, like not just Randy in the past, but also like Jesse Shell, who's still teaching there. And it, it felt like a really good fit. And so I applied and got in, thankfully. Yeah, it's an amazing program. So congratulations, actually, to both of you for applying and getting in. Um, you know, I think that's interesting. Um, that so it sounds to me like there were a few different considerations. One is the faculty there. You both talked about Randy. Um, you know, and then there were a couple other faculty you mentioned. And then both of you talked a little bit about it being very experiential, like helping, knowing that that would help you develop your portfolios and actually get to work on making real games. So it's not theoretical. You know, at the Entertainment Technology Center, they don't um, just, it, it, it's actually very hands-on in your building games. It's not just sort of studying building games or developing skills that could be used on games. It sounds like you really do actually get a lot of experience. Um, so the other thing then, though, too, is do you get a lot of exposure to lots of different kinds of games, or do you find that you guys are now even developing games um, that that you have a personal passion for? Like Albert mentioned science. Um, can you describe a little bit more about the game genres that you play and also make and why? Yeah, uh, I, can, I can take a stab at this. So. You know, coming from the ETC, their their focus is, as you said, there are a lot of projects. Mm -hmm. so not only, so you have like when you get in, so it's set up per semester. You take a different project after the introductory semester, and so not only, but you're not the only project team there. It can have upwards of like 15, 17, 20 projects going on at once. Yeah. So there's. There can be a great diversity in the different kinds of genres. So you're making like educational titles, and you're making um, emo like um, maybe transformational ones, things about sort of emotional experiences. Mm -hmm. But there's also projects there that are just purely designed to entertain and to be fun. Or there's times where it's like we have this new technology, and we don't even know what we can make out of this. So we should try doing something. And if it works, that's awesome. And if it doesn't work, well, that's the point of this exper uh, experiment. And so how do they decide what projects to do or what kinds of games to, to make at the ETC? <laughs> oh, that's a, 
that's a complicated question. <laughs> uh, I, I know it's, it's my understanding. It's a combination of students can pitch the kinds of projects that they would want to work on themselves, and then they also get. Um, actual customers like clients like companies like Disney and Lockheed Martin and other companies that actually pay the ETC to have teams of students work on their projects is that right there's also I think some projects that are also kind of like EDC internal okay like not necessarily pitched but not necessarily with a client but it's more like um, something that the faculty wants to bring into the mix as well Okay. All right. Yeah, they've been doing more recently. They've been working on sort of working with other CME departments too. So that's been really cool, seeing them work with like the robotics department at CMU, mm -hmm. or the the theater department, or the music department. But yeah, it's like one of the key components. Sort of both Albert and I actually were fortunate enough to both pitch projects at the ETC and get them accepted. Mm -hmm. And so it's really cool that you can sort of have this, have this thing that you really care deeply about and bring the core and it's like, hey, we'd love to spend a semester or two semesters exploring this idea with our own team. Right. And, you know, you've got to get it approved and everything, but once it's there and you have the, you have the ability to sort of work on it with, within the schools, within the system of the ETC. Mm -hmm. So did the two of you ever work on a project together when you were there? Um, no, I I think you graduated before I started, right? We No, we had like one semester of overlap, but I was actually um, oh, I in see. SB. So, so ETC also has um, the, another in, interesting thing is they have an uh, off-site campus in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's... um. And they work with uh, electronic arts, so it's sort of headquartered right in EA's headquarters. Okay, that so, is pretty cool. <laughs> they have like, um, typically, like three or four projects out there. Okay. So my last semester at the ETC, I went out to Silicon Valley and did a project there with the faculty in in the Bay Area. Okay. So Albert and I were. Unfortunately, we never cross paths directly at the I see. So what would you say to a kid who, for, just for instance, is somebody who has played, like, you know, MMOs or something, like some kid that is obsessed with uh, um, something like, um, I don't know, League of Legends, right? <laughs> and they have this dream that those are the kinds of games that they want to work on forever and ever and ever, and they don't really even want to think about working on any other kinds of games. What would you say to, you know, a high schooler like that? Either one of you. <laughs> <laughs> um, from, I guess from like a career point, I would say if that's what you're interested, definitely go for it. Um, but also to be very smart about it, right? Learn about what types of tools, what types of, uh, uh, what's the process people use to make those games. And it's really hard to go from zero to a hundred really quickly. It's like you can't, you can't build an MMO in, in one day. Um, so it's really about those, learning those small steps on how you can slowly build up your skills to that point, right? Mm -hmm. And so that might even include building just Small, smaller prototypes or smaller games that don't look like League of Legends mm -hmm. or don't look like World of Warcraft. But it uh, always makes sense to start small and then and slowly build up. Yeah. And it's also important to recognize like those those te those games are made by enormous teams. So it's not like there's one guy or even twenty guys just making League of Legends. So. You're, even when you're working on a large project like that, you're not going to. You're working. You're always working on a smaller piece of that project, and so especially in those cases, you want to think about well, what part do I really want to work on? Do I want to work on a combat uh, balance, or maybe I actually just care about the environmental art, or I care about the even something like the UI mm -hmm. or the game. You know, they have an 
dedicated UI artists and programmers just for just for projects of that size. So just from a practical standpoint, in your experience, are there positions on positions within game companies like that that are more in demand? So just from a purely, I want to make sure I can get a job standpoint, you know, I mean, are there like thousands of level designers but not so many artists? Or, I mean, do you have a sense of like what's kind of in demand in the game industry right now? Mm, I'll, at or, least when... Yeah. When I was uh, graduating, I think one of the the fields is kind of be it's always the fields between kind of like tech plus game design or tech plus art, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like kind of that weird mixture when you need you need, when you need to be good at two skills, um, and they really need somebody to you know figure out how how the art pipeline connects with with the lighting work or or whatever, right? Um, and it's more about, I, I feel at least, it's more about the supply and demand of, of people's skills rather rather than um, objectively which roles are more important. Yeah, I see what you're saying. So what kinds of skills would you need to do in order to satisfy that sort of creative and tech role? I mean, are you saying you need to know some programming and then some of what else exactly? Yeah. It never hurts to know some level of programming. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Even, um, even if you're just interested in, for example, being a designer, right? So there's a lot of design positions that you can't, you're not just like, you're not just saying, oh, this is how the combat should be. You got to be the guy who goes into the code mm -hmm. and scripts like, oh, yeah, when this attack happens, this is the damage output that should happen. And you need to be comfortable enough with coding and scripting to be able to go in and make those changes yourself, especially because in, you know, in games, development can move so fast that people are not going to wait up for you to, to get something implemented. It's like you got to get it done at this point. Yeah, yeah. So tell me more than about um, your title. You said you were a game engineer. Can you tell us what that means exactly and what skills you apply every day for that job? Oh, yeah. So at uh, Shell Games, sort of we have um, different disciplines. So you have engineering, you have design, you have art and production. Those are sort of the big four. Okay. There's other, there's other departments too, like uh, QA and audio etc. But so within engineering, you know, we at Shell we sort of we prefer generalists. So people who have, as Albert was saying, a broad range of skills, mm -hmm. the ability to do different parts of it. And specifically I'm the tech director on Happy Atoms. So as tech so that sort of means like I'm in charge of other engineers and I'm making sure that the basic framework of the game and the tools that we're using are good enough for everyone on the team to use. So it's like, OK, I'm not the guy necessarily implementing the immediate content of the game, but I'm a guy who makes sure like the tools and the engine we're using is good for the designers and the other engineers. And that. what kinds of factors do you use to decide whether the tools are the right ones? That can, that's a <laughs> like trade-offs, right? So uh -huh. in our case, we're we have, our studio has a lot of experience with uh, Unity 3D game engine. Mm -hmm. So we use, so, well, not only are we using Unity, but it's like, okay, we are developing this for the mobile market, so iPad and iPhone. So what are the, what are the factors there? And it's like, well, there's things we need to balance in terms of performance and devices, mm -hmm. and even, like, really simple things, like, how much battery does this use? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So in terms of like the high level engineering decisions, it's sort of like, well, how detailed and complex can the graphics on this game be if we need to run on like an iPad 2 that's like five years old at this point? It's like we need to, there's like a, there needs to be hard trade-offs that we tell the art department to follow. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of, as tech director, that's sort of on me to make those calls. It's like, yeah, we can have only this many particles in this in this moment, or we can only have the mo like the 
like the models here are too high poly, uh, so we need to cut down on that. So yeah. those are yeah. the decisions that are being made here on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, that's interesting. It paints a better. It's def that definitely paints a clearer picture mm -hmm. of you know kind of like exactly what you're talking about. Um, and so Albert, why? Well, either one of you, why did you decide to? Um, basically take the jobs that you're doing now, like, you know, doing, having your own company, Albert, versus mm -hmm. having a job at a big company, like, what made you decide that? Um, so, actually, I, I, I would have been fine if I went to a large company after graduation, because I, I know there's some people who are very creative and, and very passionate about, you know, making their own games. I'm actually okay on that level, on that scale, right? But mm -hmm. the reason that I ended up doing my own game is that there's this project I was working on uh, when I when I was still in school and it it felt like it had a lot of potential I just haven't like really worked on it yet yeah and and yeah during school it you know won some awards it got some attention but we didn't actually put anything out there to the world yet um, that was and that. I just really wanted to finish something um, that I really cared about first, and I felt that if I went to a company and worked for maybe you know two three years before I came back to do this, it would have felt like maybe too much time has passed, or or just like it would be hard to continue it as a thing. Yeah, I can understand that. Yeah, and how about you, Michael? I mean, it sounds like you're. Is, are you mostly at Shell Games, and then you run your own independent company, sort of in your spare time, or is it actually like half and half? And how did you decide, you know, what your actual career status is right now? Oh yeah, so so Shell is. Uh, I am a full time. It's the full time job, and okay. all the independent stuff is on nights and weekends. Yeah. And that's that's uh, it's really cool, actually, because that's not an opportunity necessarily afforded to everyone in the games industry, actually. Mm -hmm. So one of the reasons uh, I decided to work at Shell is it's, you know, one of the trade-offs you get when you go independent is, okay, you get to work on your own idea and you get to do something really cool that you are passionate about, but you might not necessarily have the resources or the larger support staff to pull off some of the crazier things. Yeah. It's not always true, right? But <sighs> this is something like you can, like at Shell, we have the, you know, Shell's like 100 people. So we have a lot of other engineers that I can go to to ask for help. Mm -hmm. or, and it's something where it's like, I'm not an artist. So we have an art department to handle a lot of the things here for that. And so the ability to work at a studio and be able to work on projects that you can't, I couldn't do otherwise by myself is sort of one of the draws that I decided to join Shell. Yeah. So, um, oh, shoot. The, oh, I know. So what about, I mean, what kind of advice would you give to somebody who's in high school or college and they're thinking that they want to work in the industry? Like, what kinds of things should they be thinking about now? Like, what kind of classes should they be taking? What, what would your advice be for somebody in that position? So, uh, first off, I'd say you should games, as Albert and I have talked talked about just a couple of questions ago. It's such a multidisciplinary field, right? Yeah. So there's not necessarily one skill set that will guarantee to get you in, or one skill set that'll actually be viable. Yeah. The other, because with games, things and tech, like technology, moves so fast. So you're always you always need to be learning new things every, you know, every day that you come on the job. But I will say, as I said uh, just before, being familiar with programming concepts, even if you don't, if you don't need to be a programmer at all, right? But being able to be comfortable in that discussion, I think, is such a big help. Like just even knowing, like, if I'm working with a programmer or an engineer, then these are the things that are he's capable of, or he or she is capable of doing, that helps make so many conversations easier just mm -hmm. to get into the game. Mm -hmm. 
So how do you get programming experience then? Just sort of anything, like take a class in school or um, find something on your own? Do you have any suggestions about that? Oh, Amr, do you? How, oh. did, hmm? how did you get started, actually? <laughs> Um, yeah, it was, so I ended up taking a bunch of programming classes at school, but yeah. what I ended up doing was whenever I had a chance or like an excuse almost to make a game, yeah. I did it, right? So if there was a project for a class, let's say on AI, but let's say the final project you could do whatever you want, then I would make a game game for that and then with a, with a little bit of AI in there just to make like, seem that it was related. Mm -hmm. And... And to me, it was a, a lot about just building up experience slowly and slowly by, you know, making small games. And and I think that's very important because after, every time after you make something, you get a little bit of motivation and satisfaction about what you built and you want to do it better next time, right? Yeah, yeah. And so to... Hmm? Oh, sorry, go for it. Okay, so to me... A lot of the process, it was I was less interested in learning about just about coding or about the theory and the math and behind it. But I wanted to see it in practice, and that to me was was a really good tool for um, motiv motiv uh, motivating me to learn more. Yeah, basically. yeah. And I, to add on to that, it's not like when I say you learn programming or coding, it's not necessarily you need to get deep into, like, you know, system OS level assembly. Right. Right. <laughs> you know, it's just like you can, there's so many great programs now that you can get online, things like Unity or Game Maker. Or it's like we, they do so much of the basic things for you. It's like, am, can you be comfortable in just making a game, even the simple, a simple small game? Mm -hmm. And you can just drag and drop, add in a couple of lines of code, and you can have something running and playable. Yeah. And that's I think getting that experience and that sort of comfort with uh, game development, it's doing it at, will get you really, really far, more than learning any specific language or any sp specific algorithm or anything mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. So was there anything that really surprised you um, about now that you're both, you've actually made a, you're making a living from um, working in games. Is there anything that is a lot different than you expected? <laughs> <laughs> What's so funny about that, Michael? <laughs> um, there's a lot. Do you want to take a stab at this first album? <laughs> Oh, why are you laughing? I'm just laughing because you're laughing. I <laughs> think <laughs> uh, one of the things that really surprises people is how hard it is to finish a game. Yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, and this is different than, like, I will say finishing... So if you, like, as a school assignment... You, can, you might have a prototype of something, right, and you put it out there, and it's like, okay, you know, someone can play through it, and they can get to get to win or lose state, and then they see a ending screen, and that's the game, right? And it's like, yeah, and so that's, and that's really cool, and that's perfectly valid. And then the next step up is like, okay, I want to make a game that people will enjoy, and not only enjoy, like, it'll be something, like, people will want to... That, like spend money on or purchase or something, mm -hmm. and getting that, the joke always is the last 10% is 90% <laughs> of the work, right? So it's, when I first went through the process of releasing it, it was like really surprising how much work it took to finish something. Yeah. So, and I will say, I, that's almost great motivation because it's like anytime you finish anything, it, it's an amazing accomplishment, and you should feel proud of that, no matter no matter what other people say. I would agree with that. Absolutely. What else is like the big surprise? Like you thought it was going to be what? Really creative and fun and maybe it's not or I don't know what. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, so so here's like a, a plus, a good thing, right? Is that 
it's it was really surprising to me how almost relatively you can make something really simple but still get a lot of people to play it or mm-hmm. get a lot of interest in it right so like so one example is is so the the project I worked on in school right I maybe spent like seven weeks on it and then I I ended up like bringing it to you know some conferences or events and showing showing them off there and it's really cool how as long as you have something interesting going on and doesn't necessarily have to be very complex or very polished that people will be interested because there's a lot of there's a lot of like uh, people who've played a lot of games and they're interested in finding out new stuff or checking out new things right yeah yeah that's that's interesting that's cool yeah yeah if you make something that you think is cool or fun then chances are very 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 good that a lot of other people will think the same yeah it's really easy to get caught into a loop where you stare you're working on something too long if you think like oh this is this isn't fun this is you see all the flaws or just bringing it out and having other people play your game and seeing them enjoy it mm-hmm. is such a gratifying experience it really makes the development process worth it I can understand that yeah um, you guys have a little bit mentioned in the conversation here certain tools and like um, Game Maker I heard and Unity 3D. Um, can you talk a little bit about? I mean, we get this a lot where, especially high school kids, are seemingly obsessed with which language they're going to learn. Like they have to learn Java, or they you know, or else they're nobody. Or you know, they spend a lot of time agonizing over what tools to use to make their games. Can you talk about how important it is, like what language? Languages to learn and what tools to use, and how that relates to you know your possibilities in terms of careers. Albert, what tools do you use <laughs> to make the games that you're making? Um, so right now I'm using Unity, and um, the programming language they usually use with it is C Sharp or JavaScript. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm using C Sharp right now. And in the terms of which programming languages are more important? I think it's guessing it's getting less and less relevant as time goes on, right? Because, for example, um, Unity is a game engine, and you can program in C sharp, but you can port to all these different platforms, right? You can port to uh, iOS, you can port to Android, but you can also do console stuff or PC stuff or Mac. So it's like you can through one language and one engine, you're ending up being you're getting a lot of paths. Mm-hmm. Um, and in, in that sense, it's like the language isn't the really focus anymore. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. Yeah, I would say the language is less important nowadays as much as uh, the willingness to realize, you know, five years ago, you know, Java was the thing, and now it's C sharp. And probably five years from now, there might be a new, a new language that is popular with a new engine. Mm-hmm. It's all about being willing to learn new skills, new languages as they pop up. Well, I mean, it used to be Flash, right, way back in the day, and I mean, nobody really uses Flash so much anymore. Yeah, if I'm exactly. correct, right? I did a lot of action script programming, and now that's Less and less. Well, that's not really a thing anymore. So. Yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, but I will say that one way to find some languages that you know you need master is, for example, after you have you're able to create some games, you have some work done, and you're trying to apply to some companies. If you look at their their um, job description, usually they'll say, "Oh, we need." Specifically, like a C++ programmer, or we need like a C# sharp programmer who knows scripting, or we need somebody who knows Maya but also does some scripting for that, you know, mm-hmm. whatever. And just like reading those descriptions is really helpful. Yeah. So, so reading the descriptions could certainly give ki- people, kids, a clue as to, you know, even. Trending-wise, if they read 20 of them, you know, what kinds of, if there are any commonalities, if there are, like, lots of, 
you know, people looking for a certain kind of skill set. I mean, that certainly would shape, maybe help shape your decision, I would think. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so, what about game design as a career path? Like, do you are you both happy you went into game design? And do you, if you weren't in game design, like what what else? What would your second choice be? be? Like, what else would you be doing? Um, for me, I'm definitely happy that I went into game design because I can't imagine doing something else. <laughs> it's was, it was more like I didn't have have another choice, right? Yeah. You know? Yeah, um, I I could have done like programming, just like software development or something, but that's not super interesting to me. And I tried that for um, a summer internship at some company, but <laughs> <laughs> it just it just wasn't as as interesting to me because I was doing one tiny part about one very 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 large project, which there was no way I could have seen any difference I could make. Um, and I didn't have any, it was just like, you know, look at these code and then fix the problems, basically. Yeah. Yeah, and Michael, you already described that you did some web development before you decided to go into games. So, I mean, we, we already certainly heard that part of it, um, but now that you've switched over to game design, do you ever think about going back to web development? Or are you glad you're in games? No, I, I'm also with Albert. I can't imagine ever going back at this point. Yeah. Because having gone through doing things like more productivity or making websites for like real estate companies. Yeah. You know, sort of thing, yeah. You know it's, uh, it's hard to beat the satisfaction of making something that you know or hopefully hundreds if not thousands of people will play and enjoy. Yeah, you're making something that is something not only fun for you, but can be fun for just anyone else out there on the streets, and that's yeah. that's just really really cool for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can imagine that. Um, so, what do you think about game design as an industry? I mean, you, you know, you're involved in Pigda, and I know that part of the um, game design association is looking at um, growing trends in the industry and even in Pittsburgh in itself. Um, you know, are more people going into game design? Are there is it a good career to go into um, yeah. for various reasons or not? It's interesting, right? Because um, I think what constitutes sort of games and games development is growing pretty rapidly. Mm -hmm. so it used to just be like games were you know, PC and console, and then the mobile market appeared, so it's PC, console, and mobile, and the web. And But now it's not just that. You have things like VR, virtual reality happening, and you have all sorts of interactive experiences that are not quite games, that are not quite, like, just web tools or something. It's they, They're sort of blurring the lines of what a game is, right? Yeah. So lots of... So there's a lot of people who are getting really interested in games, not just for fun, but for education or for transformation. And so the industry itself feels like it's really, it's really growing, but not necessarily in in sort of the traditional ways at this mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. What are your observations about the industry, Albert? Um. Well, for me. I feel like the game industry moves really, really fast, as yeah. Mike said. Like yeah. five years, uh, three years ago, mobile was like the the big thing, right? And now it's VR, right? Right. In three years, who knows what it's going to be? But at the same time, it's like all the previous mediums are still there. Right. Mobile like, hasn't gone away. It's just right. maybe not the hot thing, right? <laughs> Right, yeah. exactly. So you could be very comfortable just doing mobile games or just doing PC games, or some people still make like browser-only games, but you know that's that's what they like and they do it very well, mm -hmm. right? So there's no problem in like finding your niche and sticking to it if that's what you're interested in. Mm -hmm. You don't necessarily need to, you know, do the next hottest thing in, in order to make a living or find a job. Yeah. 
So um, do you hear or do you observe like what the culture is like in, um, I mean I know Albert with you and having your own thing, I mean your business culture is what you make of it, but, but in general I think a lot of people think about game design as being this industry where people are literally, you know, camped out under their desks and, you know, they play ping pong, but then, you know, there's a lot of like long hours and it's mostly like single young people and I don't know like avid gamers and I mean how would you describe the culture um, of, of and is it the same like at a place like Shell versus uh, Electronic Arts? Uh, that's a good question so uh, first off I will say at Shell we definitely have a very open studio culture Mm -hmm. And we, we really do, the, the management here really works hard on making sure people have a good work-life balance. Yeah. They want people staying till, you know, 3 a.m., sleeping under their desk. <laughs> it's definitely true, like, in, in games and in, I guess, tech in general. Mm -hmm. There's perception that you want to, you have, like, lots of crunch and you have these super long hours and you're working... We work every weekend, but it's I don't. It's definitely not not always true, and it's definitely not something that I would you know we would recommend to people to keep because it's really important for a lot of people just to have lives outside of their jobs, right? Yeah. And you know, in games in particular, the crunch people have been really trying to fight back against like. Manda mandatory crunch and all that, all the nasty side effects of like, I guess, game development 10, 15 years ago. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. That's good to hear. Yeah. And I feel like it's definitely we should, you know, stay away from crunch. In, and a lot of times, just, you know, getting more sleep makes you more productive. But at the same time, I feel in a lot of these creative industries, people will end up kind of pushing themselves a bit because they want to, you know, do something a little bit more creatively, right? Mm -hmm. And that's always kind of like a risk-reward thing, I feel. Um, but so, so currently, even though I'm working alone, I'm working at this co-working space called Game Nest. So it's okay. like a space where there's a lot of other indie developers as well, and an interesting trend I'm seeing is the idea that you know people sometimes come in for a few days and then they may, might work at home for a few days. Um, and I, it's the idea that you don't necessarily need to do like a nine to five thing, mm -hmm. right? You can work when you are most comfortable and whatever suits you best. Yeah, that's and so it's just, right. Yeah, and it's just like a more flexible way of, of working. Mm -hmm. So what about, um, I think we are kind of getting to the end of our hour, so I want to be respectful of your time. And But what um, are there any projects right now that you are working on that you would like people to know about? Uh, you know, like, is are you looking for any beta testers on any games, or are there any books you guys are writing, or anything that you want to kind of plug or encourage people to look at the Pittsburgh um, Game Association and become members, or I don't know what you tell me. Anything that you want to promote? You want to go first, Mike? <laughs> okay, yeah. So at Shell, I'm working on a chemistry game that has sort of both a physical modeling set and an iPad app where you sort of take pictures of the model. Okay. The molecule in real life. So it's called Happy Atoms, and you can go to happyatoms.com to learn about it, and we're hoping to launch later this year. And the other thing, uh, as I mentioned at the start, I'm part of the board of the Pittsburgh IGDA, and it's a open organization, and we're just looking for people in Pittsburgh who are interested in game development, and you don't need to be working as a career. You can be a student, you can be a hobbyist, or whatever. And we have meetups every two to three months. So, yeah, we should... If you're interested in what we're doing, just go to pigda.org, P-I-G-D-A.org, 
and follow us. And I, you know, I have our emails are up there, and I'm happy to answer questions from anyone in the Pittsburgh area about game development. Cool. Yeah, Mike is really cool. You should go talk to him. <laughs> Thanks, Albert. Albert's cool too. <laughs> Um, so currently I'm working on a first-person puzzle game based on forced perspective. Okay. So it's, so it's the idea that, you know, w let's say if you take a photo of the Ling Tower of Pisa, right, and let's say you get your friend to pretend to hold it up, and that it, and in your photo it looks like he's holding it up, and that's the idea of forced perspective. Mm -hmm. and so in this game you can just, you know, grab something from the distance and just, let's say, the Tower of Pisa, and then just put it on a table in front of you, and it will look the same, but once you put it down, it will be the same size as if it were on the table. Oh, I see. That sounds pretty cool. So are you going to be looking for um, any testers, or are you actually just going to be releasing it and, lo and looking for people to just buy it and play it? What stage is it at right now? Um, we might be looking for testers maybe like half a year okay. from now. All right. Um, but you can go check out the game at uh, pillowcastlegames.com. Okay, pillowcastlegames.com. All right, we'll make sure we put that in the in the show notes. Awesome. And of course, the Entertainment Technology Center at Carnegie Mellon, right? <laughs> yeah. If you're interested in game a game a game design program after your undergrad, um, you should definitely consider that. And you know. There's a bunch of different programs out there now, too, so you should look around, see what the schools are offering, because it's always, it's always a good way, even if you don't end up attending anything, mm -hmm. to look at the faculty, look who's teaching there, and just know like who's part of the industry. That's cool. That's cool. And also, to go also along to go with that, that, if you're a student, if you're a student also check out all the competition and then the scholarships you get for people doing game development. Yep. Yeah, especially, um, you know, we, we talked a lot about grad students and undergrad students, but even for high schoolers, um, things like there's NDK, which is a big independent games festival, mm -hmm. and they are, like, you don't need to be a college student to submit your game there. So if you're in, if you're interested and enthusiastic, then you should definitely check things like that out. Cool. All right, those are some really good tips, tricks, and tools. So I appreciate that. Um, and thank you both for being on today. I really appreciate it. This was a really great discussion, and I know that um, a lot of the students that we have are going to just eat up a lot of the um, advice and just hearing it from you guys, who are pretty close in age to probably a lot of the students still. <laughs> um, it, it, they always seem to really enjoy hearing um, information from their peers rather than their teachers. So thank you very much for sharing your experience and advice and the cool work you're doing. Um, so I really appreciate that. So um, anyway, uh, just basically signing off today. This was um, a game design after graduation, a Google Hangout on Air that was a monthly um, hangout as part of the Remaking Learning Using Games, Interactive Technology, and Hands-On Projects Affinity Group in Pittsburgh. And if you want to find out more about what we're doing, you can go to learn go to remakelearning.org and that's where um, you can connect with other people and we, there, I think there are some game people um, uh, you know in part of that group I think there are some people from Shell there um, because you guys do work on a lot of edu educational games and I know you've connected to some of the schools in the area through the, the, the Remake Learning Network so um, at any rate um, we will be back on oh you know about a month from now um, with another uh, uh, topic and I'm not even sure I'm not sure what our next one is. I'm looking in my notes and for some reason I don't have it in my notes. But anyway, we get on once a month. So it'll probably be like the first um, the f last week in June ish and um, you know just check in on Zulama.com and you'll be able to figure out when the next hangout is. So thanks again to Albert and Mike for the conversation today and um, hopefully we'll be able to stay in touch. Thank you guys. Thanks for inviting us. 
Yeah, Sarah. thank you. Mm-hmm.